Well, greetings, everybody. I'm Greg Gall. In my current life right here, I am the manager of medical imaging services at Wellstar Health System in Marietta, Georgia. And who we are is we're an 11 hospital network with 26 imaging centers. And up until uh, Piedmont decided to pass us again a few months ago and buy six more hospitals, we were the biggest healthcare provider in the state of Georgia. Now we're the second biggest until we pass them again. That's kind of my joke of the way healthcare is today. You never know who's going to be passing who. So what I'm, some of a little bit of my background before I switch on to the next slide. Yes. Right there. Yes. Okay. So just give you a little of my demographics where I came from. I was a biomed tech at the University of Michigan for until 2001. Came down to the Chattanooga area to a place called Erlanger Health System. It's a level one trauma center. I actually, uh, in my world, I in my first world, I did a lot of clinical stuff. So I was one of the, we were one of the strange biomeds that we were actually on code teams, trauma teams, stuff like that. So we kind of, I call it, they don't do that with us anymore, our profession. Then I switched over to uh, management over at Erlanger for 14 years, went to McLaren Health System for about two years, then moved back down to Wellstar and actually worked on an epic integration project down there. Then I switched into medical imaging. So some of the background here, you know, the, so the point I want to make is I worked in all three worlds. So the continual evolution of, due to the advancements of information technologies require adaption. And going back to the first time I got dragged into learning stuff about IT back in the eighties, this is like, unbelievable Moore's law on steroids. If you guys know what Moore's law is, every advancement in technology keeps getting faster and faster. It's like right now, if I haven't buy a new computer, it's gonna be outdated. So security has become more and more important as medical devices have become more vulnerable to cyber threats. Now, how many of you have found a cell phone charger plugged into one of your medical devices? Be honest. Yeah. yeah. Like sleeping, I mean. Let's see. Is she sleeping again? Yeah. Okay, now I'm trying to see. I think, I think, yeah, there we go. We're working. Okay, we're back. Okay. <laughs> and, th and this is one of the things that, if you don't know who Barter Brown Brown is, think uh, the guy who put the Apollos into the air, Huntsville, Alabama. You know, research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. And some of this, like, oh, this isn't rocket science. A lot of this is common sense. But he was a rocket scientist. He was a rocket scientist. I'm not, though. You know, it's one of those things, but I did sleep at a holiday and at one point in my life. So things to always ponder. And this is one some of the scariest things that keep people up at night. One of the things that changed in life is bring your own device. Everybody now, it's become more and more prevalent that employers will want you Basically, use your own cell phone for work. And that has become a debacle, would probably be the politest way to look at it. Because a lot of people don't mind it if it's a work cell phone, great. Some of the people, like we had a uh, Phillips Dispatch initiative coming out, and the, all they said, all you have to do is point at your QWERTY code on your window for your MRI, and you can register a service call. And they said, well, whose phone? You know, so some of the people were very, they thought this is great. Other people said, this is my private phone with my private, you know, my data plan. I don't want to use this for hospitals. So remote monitoring, one of my friends uh, out in Missouri, remote monitoring patients, vital signs in uh, real time. You know, this has become more and more prevalent, you know, especially during the COVID time because people were just fanned out everywhere. I know his network. He had, they had hundreds of patients monitored directly from home. Inter interoperability, systems need to send and receive data. They'll be compatible on all user platforms. This is a nightmare because there is a lot of systems we had that just don't talk to each other. And this is, continues to be a problem. Device mobility, you know, everybody, uh, 
we haven't got to it yet in our new database, but we're hoping to have you know mobile work orders at some point up here. I would love to be like UPS. I see real time when people are closing work orders. I know I'll get there someday. And this is another scary one. 50 billion wireless devices are expected to be added by 2020. Guess what? It's 2020. And this is, it keeps going. And, so, and this is the, uh, unfortunately, I had one of my friends point out to us, we made it on the front page of the paper where we had a data breach at Wellstar. I haven't found out what went on yet, but this happens everywhere. And our IT division is very robust. And so I'm waiting to when I get back to the hospital to see if anybody sends a broadcast to say exactly who, you know, who, where, when, what happened. But 65% of all data breaches are from inside a company. Now, but that's not intentional, right? I mean, there's a oh, no, they're not intentional. Somebody clicks on a link by accident. Oh, yeah. Well, one of the easiest things that happened to us, and this was a nightmare, was Java. We had everybody would log into computers and we had this in IT meetings. And part of when I was working on the Epic integration process, I would go to all the IT meetings. And as I transitioned to my new job, they already knew, I knew more than the average person on this. So I still attend those all the time. And the catch was like Java, for instance, they were charging us for different instances of Java. And what happens is if you think about this, and even anybody, like you said, just click on this. Every time somebody puts up a link and you click on it, you have no idea what is hiding, like, you know, what, if a person in Java is hiding behind it. So all of a sudden, if you're licensed for, let's say, Java 7, I'll just pick a number out of the air, and you have every variation of mankind known up to there, somebody does a lot on you and says, hey, guess what? You're using this for free. And it's like, well, no, I didn't use anything for free. Somebody was, you know, taking a break at work and they clicked on belk.com. And so, you know, most of this is not malicious. In fact, some of the worst, uh, like the debt where we've had uh, devices that actually got viruses installed, a lot of them were vendors using simple RAM sticks. And, that, and they're a person that could be going, it's like Typhoid Mary. This vendor could be going all around, especially Metro Atlanta. You could hit all the four major hospitals with the same vendor, and instead of it coming through the firewall, it just goes right in the side of their device. And then, one, and if they don't know it, that's a big deal. Now, one thing my one of my employers did, let's just say one, was we had all were given encrypted, basically RAM sticks called Iron Keys. Each one of ours was basically logged us, so that way that saved a lot of this nightmare. So before you're starting to deal with this world, you know, one of the things is if you're a pure biomed, this can be a scary endeavor. You know, internal inventory, your staff and your educational background. How much experience do you have in this? You know, you have to check on your staff because it's even if I keep switching jobs, I've had everything from highly skilled people who knew this? My first job at the University of Michigan when we were finished our Eastern degree, one of my coworkers was benchmarking uh, components for PC World magazine. So we had a whole bunch of people who were doing IT projects. We were biomeds, but some of these guys surpassed anybody in IT. Certifications. The one thing you learned about IT people, we you hear A plus, Net plus. They have a uh, they have the potpourri, we have a few initials behind us, CBT, CHTM, stuff like that. These guys have a whole array of initials and that part of when you're getting the credibility of working with them. Uh, years ago, we had a biomed specialist at one of my jobs we created and part of his college degree was he kept getting all these certifications. And when we started working with IT, him having those all those credentials gave him pretty much a free to start working in the network and working with them because they knew he was a safe entity. You know, it wasn't just somebody going out uh, kind of rogue. <coughs> Understanding basic concepts. Software right now, who knows Windows 7 is going away? Everybody? Yeah, this is a, yeah, it's, it's coming up quick. Now everybody remembers the days of XP? Same thing. Antivirus. 
you know, antivirus software. That is another nightmare. Who, a uh, local network administered, this stuff will cause havoc on your medical equipment, especially from the IT people. Hardware interface sim issues, network limitations, network components, network designs and topology. All this stuff, when you're, if you're in a biomed world and you start, like when I learned the most, I put most of my education to use in the beginning was we were doing a whole house monitor network of over 110 patient monitors. And at that point right there, you started having to learn all this stuff about how is this stuff wired together? Where is all this stuff going to go? You know, how many switches do I need? How many routers? All that stuff. Even though IT may control it, you need to know where it's at because it becomes critical to your business. Because if the network goes down, you may have a standalone monitor, but the way that staffing, especially now, has become, you've become central station reliant. And if something goes down and it only alarms in the room, you know, you've got a staffing issue. So some of the ways to expose yourself to equipment and network and on the equipment network, medical devices with open access to the internet. This has is, been a problem for years. I remember we had an EEG machine at one point that IT had pointed out to us that it was going places it shouldn't. We tried to get it locked down. The manager of the department said, well, when this person's going out to these shopping areas because of their job scope in theory they could be making recommendations for the person for war you know it was a stretch but wardrobe this or that and so you kind of said well if i really stretch this you know to the nth degree yes i can see where they may once in a blue moon need to go out to shop uh, shopping you know like to quarry something for some sort of apparel reason, like a wig or something like that for uh, trauma victims or that. Unencrypted USB drives, open ports on any device. That is, that's something we're still working with and that's been longstanding. Unauthorized software installations. So I mentioned- the open USB ports, are you finding ways to stop them? Lock them down by software or hardware? I'll show some of that because uh, what I, we've been using is we, we were using uh, actually locking devices. Because that's uh, some, because once also too, when you start using the hardware stuff, our skill set of our group, we have to rely on the vendor to do that a lot of times, or we're going to have to rely on IT. And I'm not, this is not a bash on IT by any means, but if you're in the biomed world, a priority one call means how many minutes you have to respond usually? Okay. Yeah, probably about 15 minutes at the most. A priority one, when I was part of IT, that was our parent. Priority one call was four hours. Unless the CEO lost Excel, then it was 15 minutes. So, yeah, so as we're talking, so as we're talking about some of the, that's the difference in our world. Social media, you know, everybody knows right now, especially during COVID time, you know, everybody was, yeah, Facebook, things like that. We have Facebook pretty much knocked off our computers at Wellstar because of just that simple matter of how much time this can distract people. Facebook, um, unsecured laptops. This is a nightmare because what's happening now more and more is the function is becoming, the, fu the form of the handheld is now an ultrasound. And what people don't realize, and I just had this discussion, we had some wonderful Philips ultrasounds that came in. They're actually Samsung tablets. And we were trying to work out and say, hey, look, guys, before you put these out, we really need to be careful about these because if you put them out to a lay person who's walking through, number one, they're not secured. You can just take it, drop it in the backpack, it's gone. Because if we don't have an RTLS located or some sort of survey, you know, any bigger hospital before COVID, the exits were like a sieve. People could just walk out the back door and you wouldn't see it. So, lax update processes, that's pretty common where people just don't keep their software up to date. Or it becomes a problem where, like right now, we had from IT when they said, all your stuff needs to be off Windows 7. I said, by December 31st, I said, cool. And they 
gave me a couple of lists of devices and I said, a uh, bunch of them were MRIs. And I, and I said, uh, just need about $12 million and we're good. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I said, well, they can't get there from here. You know, you need to, so it's like XP, when the days of XP happened, you couldn't, you could not get every device off XP before it went out of support. They had to make some remediations. Ensure proper access levels with users. One of the things I used to hate with vendors, they give the admin password to everything. You know, they're training somebody. I like this person. I'm going to give them the, despite what biomed or IT or anybody told them, I'm going to give them the admin password or they just let somebody look over their shoulder. You know, limited access outside the hospital network, no internet, you know, unless absolutely necessary on clinical devices. Like I said, that EEG machine drove me batty for years because it had that access. Now, create an exception list that IT knows about all the clinical equipment that will minimize the risk. We had at one point, I remember one night, we got an alert coming through that actually one of our vendors told us. They said, oh, we just saw across uh, all of our GI labs, that vendor said, I saw an alert that said they are going to push a patch. They decided to go home for the night, and we just happened to be, you know, it was a Friday night, and there were a couple of us there at 6 o'clock at night. They said, oh, if that patch hits your devices, everybody shut down Monday morning. I said, what? And I said, you just couldn't, you know, pull the plug on these things and let us know. And so we had to run up there just before, probably within 30 minutes, we pulled everybody off the network before that patch came out. Lock USB ports. Yeah, as we were talking about earlier, this is a company, they're actually around uh, Huntsville, Alabama. They make a lot of good stuff. They're uh, called the Connectivity Center. So they have port lockers, they have, you can take for hospitals, you can take for modalities, you can make special keys that unlock these ports. These guys make some really robust stuff. So, um, you know, they're worth definitely, all these slides are available. They're definitely worth checking out. They have been fast, fantastic for years to work with. Remember I said about those laptops? One thing we did was we started getting laptops coming in and we realized they're gonna be in harm's way. Unfortunately, it looks a little draconian, but you know, you'd put the dog leash on it. So it didn't stop people from getting something, but it would do, you know, you weren't going to pull it away without ripping the case apart. The other uh, enclosure over there is basically what a gun safe for PCs, you could call it. So you do is you put your PC in there, lock it down, only the person that has the keys can get access to it. You can type external hard drives. Yeah. Instances we could convince people not to use them. Yeah, and that, that is. External hard drives are another big one. Now, a funny story about that was, unfortunately, it's a funny, sad story, but when I took over my job, my predecessor, who was a radiology tech, had lost at one point all of his files on one of our shared drives. So what he did to circumvent that was he bought a little hard drive. I called it the hockey puck. So when I took over the job, we really, we crossed paths like chips in the night. So we got to meet one time two weeks before he left. I showed up and then he said, here's the passcode for the for this down here. Here's where all the stuff's at. You know, all the service contracts, all the day, all the stuff for his two years in my job was on the hockey puck. So lo and behold, as I was just getting the hang of a job when you take it over when you don't have any transition, one day I came in and there had been a power surge in the building and the hockey puck was now toasted. So it had nice burn marks all over it. And I said, well, there goes that. <laughs> so we were saying about like, you know, how you're securing hard drives and things like that. There was no backup for a lot of the stuff you had. And so I'll never know. I think I saw it one time and I said, okay, I got to get all this stuff to a shared drive. But it was one of those endeavors, two years of files. It's a lot of work. And this is uh, wild cards. How many people have had the privilege of working on wild cards? Just me? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, these, these are some of these things about historically, you know, these may or may not fall into biomed. In my one life at McLaren Healthcare, 
unfortunately, they fell into our world, and they were a little bit of a pain. You know, devices with a fan. I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I called in at one of my jobs. I would be in the emergency room, and I would see one of the wild carts with dust bunnies hanging out the side of it this far, saying, "Don't you guys clean these?" You know, and actually got us into trouble at McLaren. Not us into trouble, but IT didn't clean theirs, and one of them caught on. Believe it or not, it caught on fire. And that was why we inherited wild carts. There was some of those, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but they had rechargeable batteries. So you could unplug a battery, put it in a charging station, click back in a wild cart, and those batteries were catching fire. Yeah. I know I turned some stuff into equity on that. Yeah, we had, uh, it was actually kind of a bummer because we, when we were looking to rebid those uh, same wild carts, what happened was the hospital I went to, we picked a really robust vendor, and the wild cart was. Well made is one of the ones where you could roll it and you know from this area like if you tripped and it accidentally hit the wall or something it would hit it but it wouldn't damage the wild card and it wouldn't damage the pc either because they have protections around it unfortunately they went with something much cheaper in fact it was the one vendor who caught on fire who were trying to avoid and but that was a philosophy they had was uh it wasn't cheapest and best it was just cheapest and cheapest and so that's, you know, that was unfortunate. Now in this life, connections to PACs, wow, that has been a uh, learning curve for me. Because PACs will, used to be part of us right before, but when I started, the PACs people were in, were literally, they crossed like ships and then I made a joke that they went to IT on the same floor that I came from. So we kind of traded. So now, you know, we do do a lot with that. First thing we did was an ag integration to PACS, and that was a learning curve on our part. And we've been working diligently on IP addresses <laughs> at a lovely thing called AE titles. Because, of, and uh, I've been very fortunate, I had a good relationship with all of our IT people. And what we're working is to keep making our database more and more robust because we all realized we did have a weakness. Because first time that they uh, ran me, I said, Here's the IP address and the AE title. You guys go out to that device and go get it. Change the IP address. And I was like, what is it? You know, it's a, to us, it's an IP address. Well, we know what building it's in, but is it the MRI? Is it a CT? Is it an ultrasound? What is it? Is it? And so that was a nice, you know, the, the managers I'm working with now, we have that clear communication of what we're trying to do. Because go chase an IP address. It's like chasing a feral cat. Your internal boundaries. How far does your department currently work in the IT environment? If you're part of IT, it's usually not bad. You can tap somebody on the shoulder. If you don't, uh, if you're contracted, heaven forbid your IT department's contracted, there's a whole process you have to go through. You know, IT, in-house, contract, or a mixture. I've been in each version. What are your limits to the access? I mentioned that biomed specialist, before we, he, we created him, we basically had little or no access to being the network. You know, how good is the relationship? You'll see that through all of our profession. The relationships you create with some of these departments will tell how far you're going to go. If you come in like a bowl in the China shop, you're probably going nowhere. You know, the limitations of your employer even. You know, pulling your cables and your networks. I know in our world currently right now, we contract all that out. But I've had the full spectrum at one point in my career when I started, we pulled our own cables. You know, we removed our own cables because part of the doctrine was before all the ceiling penetration stuff got really strange. We would, if something got installed, we would oversee it. But we had to, conversely, we had to get every abandoned cable out of the ceiling. And who assigns and controls IP addresses? Make sure you know and also give people plenty of time to know you need an IP address. You know, formal pro you know, how do people request a project? I know in my current world right now, anytime I do anything in a database, mm -hmm. I have to put basically like a change order. I have a new database and I had a lovely thing called a parent tag. That was, I had a system, mm -hmm. I had siblings, and I said, our new database, we didn't have that. And I said, well, this should be pretty easy. They just put the field in, no problem. 
Instead, it, become a it became a change order. So I went through a whole chain, and I, that was part of when I was in IT. Every Thursday for two hours, we would have a change meeting. And you had 50 people on a conference call. Well, starts huge, explaining all the changes that are coming up in the next 30, 60 days. And so instead of that fleet footedness of I just need to fix this, it's now weeks before you get something done. You know, who determines the priority? Like I said, if it's the CEO's Excel spreadsheet doesn't work, you know what's going to happen. If it's your spreadsheet that doesn't work, you're important to our call. I had that happen actually. My, I had one of my, uh, my dispatcher listen for me. I had to get my computer fixed. I put myself in the queue. I went and got breakfast a mile away walking, walked back. And they said, congratulations, you are now number seven in our queue. And it was like, you know, hour later, I'm still in the queue. And guess what? I'm the manager of medical imaging services. <laughs> and that's about as far as I could go. Cable pulls, I can't stress that enough. Lead time for building interfaces. This is one of, could be a, a little bit of a horror story. They, we were at one point, one job I had, we were buying physician practices. Part of our job was we go out and check the medical equipment. And then they go, okay, we want to bring these guys in in 30 days. There's a lot of components, HR, things like that. But the thing that I ne it never even got a full scope of is you have to build all this billing inside of physician's practice. And at one point, our IT department, it was they were on a four to six month backlog. So the administrators of the hospital said, we bought this doctor, we're going to put him online, the practice is going to be working in 30 days. That first meeting was like, well, that's went to heck in a handbasket. And the other thing is, does IT create their own separate budget? And that was another problem we had. So if you're budgeting, if somebody calls you into a project, you can get into a lot of trouble because you're trying to, you're either trying to budget for something or you're neglecting to budget for something because you need to know that it's somebody taking care of, like I said, those who put supports in the wall, who puts the wireless antennas up. Okay. This, and as we're talking about the equipment, one of the things that we're document happy, all of us should be. All compliance documents in my current life, my new database, I'm st still not totally up and running, but one of the strong parts of it, every document I get, I can scan now. I can attach it to its birth certificate, as I call it, its birth and income inspection work order. So I have everything from blueprints to all this stuff like compliance documents. My hope is I don't have that horror that my uh, predecessor had that all of a sudden it disappears one day. But we do keep like the hard copies of it. But that's right now we went from full paper to we're trying to move to a paper. The only thing I want to have is one file that's the birth work order, birth, you know, some of the important documents and a hard file. Because uh, bad thing with paper files, you have your sprinkler go off and guess what? It's gone. So secure all software licenses. We used to have in one of my areas, we had a locked file cabinet that nobody had access to. GE years ago, when I was doing a patient monitoring system, they gave us our licenses and they said, you better lock these up. If you lose these, this is a quarter million dollars. And they said, that's on you, not us. And so I don't know if they still have that process, but that was one of those things in life where you go like, I have left that company you know, seven years ago. Hopefully somebody realized those licenses I had locked in that drawer are pretty important. You know, make a make a backup copy if you can of any software if possible. Create secondary storage areas. You know, set, don't keep all your eggs in one basket. It's the simplest way to look at it. what we're working on right now in the IT in our uh, imaging world. All software revisions, IP addresses, AE titles, antivirus, any important information that keeps that device alive, especially on a network. One of the things you will hear from IT, and none of this is ever a slam towards IT, because we had the same issue. We had a call where we couldn't get an image over to one of our systems. And we went back and forth. It turned out that the one person who was an expert on it said, I managed the application. 
So what happens is they're looking at purely does the application work? From their world, it may work. The problem I have is I'm trying to get an image from my cath lab to my PAC system. So I'm going, I have a starting point, I have a finish line. Where they were looking at until, and it took a lot of going back and forth to get all the right people in, was they said, we manage, for lack of a better term, I manage Windows 10. If Windows 10 is working, we're good at your problem. And it turned out, no, it was an application problem. And actually over multiple sites. But that became another whole quandary of like, you know, it's 30 miles away, there's a network, there's something wrong with your stuff, not ours. Document as many network relationships as possible. In one of my lives, we did exactly that. I knew what monitor, went to what comm closet, went to which, you know, I could trace it wherever it went. Hardware requirements, some of the things you can do is get all your specifications in writing, operating system software. I'm gonna watch my time here. Okay. You know, who supplies what in writing? Use of like what we did in the past, one of the and this can be a nightmare too. Use of OEM and alternative suppliers. We had a GE network we were putting in, and they like Nortel equipment. They certified their network through the FDA with Nortel equipment. We were a Cisco show site. So the last thing Cisco wanted to see when they opened one of our closets on a tour was Nortel. And that was one of the most pro almost uh, adversarial meetings we ever had explaining why I don't care what you want, you are not putting Cisco on our network. You know, mixing and matching components. There is some pros and cons you can do with mixing and matching stuff. You can get alternative suppliers. Were you all mixing closets though between Biomed and IT? Yes. They, 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 IT would not let us in the closet, which I was okay with. So we actually, when we built a hospital, we had an IT closet and we called it low voltage because basically everything else was right next to it. And I, you know, we didn't have access to the IT closet, they didn't have access to ours. And some of our newer constructions, so that I've, that issue there, but we uh, had the same thing that they wanted us to use standards. In some of my worlds, the problem I've had in some of my buildings is I've had, um, when one life I had, our oldest building was 1938, which our real estate was shot. In fact, when they turned our cath lab into a server farm, they went to actually install all the servers in that old cath lab area. And what they didn't realize in 1938, the floor ratings for poundage were a little different. And as they started putting the weight in there, they realized they were gonna basically, Richard shaking his head, he remembers this. All of a sudden, the servers on the fourth floor were gonna be rapidly be on the third floor, which would be on the second floor, which would be on the first floor. And let's see. Hey, so, I have somebody um, who just submitted a question or uh -huh. a statement from the virtual audience. Um, it looks like they wanted to say not all equipment will accept an encrypted thumb drive. Is that true? That's highly possible. Okay. Like I said, the main thing we use that for is anytime that was a hospital policy. And what they just wanted to do is like, you know, when you sell these vendor fairs, this was a good one out here. How many times have you gone out and they used to just give out thumb drives, dozens of them to you? And, uh, the worst thing was is physicians. I think we found one outside of one of our hospitals and uh, it was actually broken. And it looked like something you kick in the garbage. One of our people happened to say, oh, let's just see what's on this. It was loaded with PHI. It was a doctor's, you know, and if you look at this and said, this thing's got the covers cracked off of it. This is, you know, some homeless person dropped this. And that was like, you know, the most volatile piece that we had that we found. Richard shaking his head again. I think he heard about that one. <laughs> and so, uh oh. Gotta wake her up again. I apologize. That broke my own rule. Oh, wait. Right slide. There you go. That's where you yeah. were. Yep, that's where you were. So let's, uh, okay, suppliers in writing, identical components purchased through hospital sources versus vendor. 
one of the things we did on one of my major installs, like back in the 90s, and okay, where did you work back in the 90s, Dave? Were you down at Baylor? Yeah. I, I actually, you know, one of the catches was we had a whole group of people who were doing the same projects. And I tapped everybody that was on that list of, and said, hey, what, what are some of the best practice you guys are doing to mitigate costs? And one of our counterparts, and I can't remember if it was you guys or one of the other ones, they said, we're not buying any displays for your solar monitors from the OEM. We learned that if we went out, and this sounds a little crazy back in the day, but if we went out and bought standard computer displays, which were about the same size, we took and we actually put a UPS on this, we still ended up saving basically five for one. So if we bought one GE display, we could buy five of these setups. And the catch would be, as I looked at the longevity of this, and flat panels you know, came along pretty, you know, flat panels back in the early days were horrifically expensive. And we saved a lot of money by mixing up those components. They weren't too happy with us, but a lot, but once the first person figured out, got that push through Jayco, a whole bunch of us followed right behind and said, hey, you know, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if it was you guys that did it or not. We did printers, I don't remember doing monitors. Yeah, because we because we did the same thing with printers. We never bought a printer from the OEM. Security risks. Well, there be any interface to the medical records, I mentioned we've already had that. Mm -hmm. You have to know that in advance. Well, patient data that you have unique identifier. Well, anything be stored on the device that's unique. You have to always remember that when you go down and do PMs on devices, check and see what they keep inside of them. And also figure out whether it's volatile memory or it's something that's recoverable. Remote physician access. That was another nightmare I had where a doctor wanted uh, access across a building. And what happened was his child, where you bring him into the, from his private office, would actually play on his computer that was, and so basically he was going anywhere he wanted to, like you know, at that point, and that became a royal nightmare for us. Mm -hmm. Who owns the computers? That's another thing. If the doctor owns the computers, he insists on his computer, that's where we had a rough learning curve where they folded that deck of cards and said, we'll just let him do whatever. Hospital policy for remote access. Support issues between IT and medical devices. You know, like I said, the priority, priority for us is get it done now. Priority for everybody else may not be that. IT support, as I said, I already mentioned this application, so I'm not gonna go over it. Medical imaging and biomed are primarily focused on the device. Resistance to allow remote ven vendor support to a network, that still is a problem because there is critical stuff a vendor needs access to. One of the things in-house, if you want to do this, and some per people don't want anything to do with it, is you start by buying your test equipment. And so we did that in my first life. We started, we learned everything IT had, and we tried to mimic everything they had develop an in-house testing area, locations, network connections, common components. We would salvage racks and things like that that we would use for eventually for our own stuff. Patient monitoring components. So this back in the day, this does not exist anymore, I've heard. Does it Richard or is it long gone? That's what I figured. So what happened is we were doing a, and this is kind of heartbreaking, but anyways, as you look at the red and green right there, that is our patient monitoring. And what we designed was, we had just down the hall from our biomed shop, you could literally, someone would call up and say, I have a problem with this monitor. And I had this at, first time I did this was at the University of Michigan. Someone would call me, could call me up and say, I've got this problem. I could click onto my central station and I didn't have to run a half mile across the building to figure out what was going on. It was right there. This had access to every patient monitor, every telemetry system, solar winds, the whole nine yards. So this was, you know, looks a little primitive, those pieced together out of uh, parts, but also too, what it did serve as, we would don't, we let nursing come in and actually do educational stuff on the monitor. So if they wanted to train somebody on a monitor or something, we'd actually let them use that. Because you see, we've got down here, we've got all the, our biomed test equipment to simulate stuff. 
opportunities and dead ends. What's a good opportunity and what will get you hung? Most common pitfalls are ending up supporting IP in the wrong way, supporting devices where I, which are not directly connected to patient care. I have a strict rule. I try to stay out of anything that is not involved with patient care. Assuming roles without funding. If you decide to take on something, again, that's on top of your base salary, that can be a serious problem because all of a sudden, you, you once you start doing something, it becomes a uh, basically an expectation of users that you will do this from here on out working as a system administrator many times everything from nurse call systems to any other type of system something that should have been clinical we'd start it up and say just as a favor enter these users for us then all of a sudden the system administrator that they didn't hire hey it's only just you know it takes a couple minutes and over time, all of a sudden, those couple minutes become an hour, two hours, three hours. You know, support taking on stuff outside your staff skill set. If you're sta if you don't have the depth in your staff to do this, consider what you need to acquire that person, what you need to educate that person, but don't take any, but stay within your skill set because you're doomed yourself to failure. Mentioned solar wind, zing box. Currently in my current life. Zingbox is uh, what we use, solar winds. Uh, we've got some solar winds also, but uh, solar winds was a wonderful thing we had. Uh, actually, we bought it out of a telemetry project for our IT department. And we actually, because they didn't want to touch our stuff, they turned us over and let us set everything up for solar winds. And that was the best thing we ever had because we could watch all of our monitors. Brainscape, what this was, was this was a really wild hybrid that came out of Israel that one of our stroke doctors had. It looked like a wow. And what it was, it was actually a device that inserted two needles up the back, basically where it was right behind your uh, wisdom teeth. And in the advent of a stroke, and I don't know how far this has gone out, but it, this was the first one in America that came out. And we just happened, I did a favor because he said, I don't want this sitting on the dock. I'm going to a conference. And I said, I'll make you a promise. I'll take everything in the system and put it in my office. And this thing was fantastic because what it would do is it would basically dilate, and the advent of a stroke, what it would do is dilate all the blood vessels in the brain in that area. And what happened is somebody who may have went out either from a serious stroke not left the hospital again. The first time that this came online, and I'll give a lot of credit to the group that was there, the IT person and our specialists that brought this online. The first patient that came in on an ambulance that 48 hours before, they would have left out the back door on a gurney, dead. In this case, they walked right out the door. And uh, we had a fantastic doctor, Dr. Uh, Devlin. Pre-planning, what members of the staff, and this is a common thing, talk to your departments, who needs to be involved? Who is who is doing this? Where are you gonna put it? All the documents, floor plans, what are you trying, what are you trying to put where? David brought to mind a good point. If you don't know, if there's no IT closet in your world that you're supposed to have, that's going to be a red flag. You have to do some negotiations before you even start on these projects. You know, what's your role? What's the role of your department? Planning stages, you know, won't go over all this. There's a lot of information on these slides. Data storage was a, you know, that was another big deal. Who, you know, how much data storage do you need? I had a program called Excel Bedmaster. I don't know if you've ever heard of that at all. It was, uh, a wonderful vital signs repository that basically you could have somebody come in the door in the ED, collect every vital sign and every parameter they had for as long as you wanted. If they were there for weeks, you could keep as much as you wanted, but there is a cost. Where are you gonna put this stuff? A lot of the people, if you're in a research institution, this is like gold right here. You know, if I can store it somewhere, and also who's going to take care of the data over there. Like we made, we worked with the system like from Excel and I just say you can look them up. They're still in business. Uh, they were the Marquette, they were a spinoff of Marquette Electronics. 
if any of you guys are, I'm dating myself now. There's a real sharp group of IT people that didn't show up when GE took them over and I always wondered what happened to them. I found them. Still in Jupiter. Huh? I think they're still in Jupiter. Uh, yeah. So they're, and they're, uh, that was like the brain trust. I had a lot of cutting edge stuff that just disappeared when GE came along. Oh, this is one of the things that's giving me not nightmares. There's no such thing as a free puppy. All right, when one of my projects, our IT group said, you don't need to buy racks because we've got some we can give you. I was on vacation and graciously my boss said, thank you. He was, a, but what the problem was, they didn't have wheels on them. They tossed the wheel kit. So by the time they got installed and he gave them the green light, Nobody realized in this one telemetry area, we had to actually move these out to clean them out and do service on them. So now you have a rack that weighs probably five or 600 pounds that you have to try to figure out how to move out. So uh, another horror story I had was, we reused a telemetry on one of my jobs, a telemetry antenna system from a prior vendor. And the catch was, can the, the question was, can we use it? And after much pushback, they said, okay, fine. You can use it to save a little money. The real question should have been to them is should we use it? As this system went along on my 40th birthday, I got a call and said, congratulations, your, tele you know, your telemetry system has had a full failure in this floor of your hospital. We were about this far from getting our new system in. And I'll tell you what, I was, I have a long history of telemetry. The first time I popped my head in the ceiling, I was livid because I, I found stuff that was, and this came back on the vendor too. And uh, there was way too much wire. There was stuff running to closets to nowhere. And this whole thing collapsed. And so, uh, so did they save a lot of money in the get go? Yeah, we went, but we went on divert for uh, about, I think a week or two until we got a temporary system installed that, until we get our new system put in. Like I said, just because, just, you know, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Think about long-term. I was looking at it, if I'm not at a job in five years, what matters to me? Patient care. I didn't do anything to cause the situation that should have been uh, avoided. You know, budgeting issues, we're going to pass on that a little bit. Data conversion requirements. I know in my current database, we couldn't even convert work orders to it. So if you think about, you know, from one system to another, think of all the stuff like such as far as uh, back in the days, like all those CDs that used to be hanging out in someone's closet. They want to convert it. Who's going to convert it? That can be a daunting task. Keep mentioning those software licenses. Make sure you know what you're putting in. You know, vendor software support, you know, this is something too that back and forth between IT divisions. Who supports the software? Who supports what on each side? You know, what is the lifespan of the software? Where are you at? And because you can literally, we were buying stuff that had Windows 7 on it. But unfortunately, because when you had to buy it, you already knew that you had to upgrade it, which you were going to get caught for. Do we have another question? Um, I think we're okay right now. Okay. How am I doing? Okay. Upgrade path evergreen. Have a plan. If you can, evergreen means that you keep the technology current if you can. Remediation of software conflict issues. Annual support costs, that's something else that even in the current situation I'm doing with a database, one of the things that I ended up in the middle of was I, because I was in the IT wing for a little while, the person who maintained our old database heard we were going to a new database and she said, well, who's paying for this? Who's maintaining this? I maintain the old one. And I said, I'm just out of courtesy. I know you did this. I'm just bringing you the news that this is coming and I don't know who's going to pay for what but I thought you should know so you can go and ask the question, those pertinent questions of how are we gonna support this? You know, something as crazy as an IT, our 
Biomed Work Order Database. You buy 10 licenses, you have 20 employees, you need to figure out what you need for licenses. How many, what's the worst case scenario that people can be on a system? When we're talking about some of the tour, here's some of the stuff I've had over the years. You know, spectrum analyzers, I used a lot of those for telemetry. My first spectrum analyzer was actually uh, in 2000, it was actually $35,000. But I bought the exact spectrum analyzer that GE had. So every, and that was the same thing when we did our large telemetry upgrade. Every piece of equipment that they used, we budgeted for. So we owned our own version of it and we maintained it. And this is, uh, oh, this was fun. We went on a site survey in downtown Chattanooga and somebody said, we're just gonna slap this system up and this was at Lifestyle. And what you see here is in downtown Chattanooga, all the stuff that was sitting around the frequency where this stuff was gonna go into. And what you also see is really cool is you see the haunted house that's in the same spectrum as your telemetry system. So they had a haunted house going on in that time frame. So the importance of going out or paying somebody to do this will avoid all sorts of nightmares. You know, documentation, define the locations and network closets, we talked about that. Challenging areas. This was a neat one. We got a call, we are looking at the windows there. That was actually, before we did this, that was a gymnasium that I got a call one day and said, in, Less than 90 days, this is going to be a 12 bed ICU. I said, what? <laughs> and part of the challenge, I'm from Michigan originally, you do not want windows externally with all this plumbing and stuff like that back there because it's gonna freeze. Which it actually did, but that's another story. So what you're looking at here is we put together a really nice patient monitoring system. The original estimate that came through was over half a million dollars. I managed to, this is what I call my eBay monitoring system. I pulled it in for $85,000, piecing it together by multiple vendors. People always thought I bought them a brand new monitoring system. And so it was all in the quality of what you bought. The displays were brand new, none of the rest of it was new. And this is my favorite, Beauty and the Beast. Guess which one was ours? Mm -hmm. One guess. The one on the left is ours. The one on the right is what you'll typically see in IT closets. So we had all of our stuff was color coded and uh, that's the biggest thing I recommend. If you don't do it now, start migrating to that. Pick colors that people don't use. And also we could walk in and troubleshoot anything in here and we could say this goes to right here. I have no idea how they troubleshoot the one on the right. I know when we built new hospitals for years, I don't know when the meeting was, but it was pretty early on and they would have a decision on uh, each vendor would choose their color code, yeah. right? So if we had GE, whatever it was, they had those two colors and yeah, fire pink and green. red and IT yeah. was blue and somebody mm -hmm. else was it. And I thought that was great. I mean, it helped you oh, absolutely. figure out who was who. Well, and that's the first thing we did at Michigan was we did that was we, we did it on that project we did 1999 to 2001, we selected our colors. What happened was where IT jammed us was they left the boxes of patch cables just in the room. And so what happened was I think we'd go in and check our closets occasionally because back in those days I was a biomed, you know, I was a specialist in it. I walk in a room and all these cables, this color should have been in this rack. All of a sudden you look around this massive room and it's like, oh my God, they're all over the room. And this was in a matter of like within 90 days. And so I just picked up all the boxes, that stuff took it away. And I you had a little come to Jesus moment and said, get all this stuff out of here. Or we're going to go through with wire cutters and cut them all. And they, you know, they fixed it pretty quick, but that circumvented that whole thing because there was a box over there that had some patch cables. The lay person, they just slapped them in. But that's what we came up with. So as you can see, everything's color coded, everything's clearly labeled. This made troubleshooting a dream. <coughs> oh, this was fun. We were doing that telemetry. We actually was riding on a Sprint cell phone network. 
And they said, no problem, we can get from one building to the next building. They're simple pass-throughs. Well, that is a stairway in between two buildings of what we used to call back in the day, the medical mall and our, nine, and our 38 building. 38, what was it called, the 3800 building, Richard? What was our building called, 1930, the 1938 building? Is it a 3800 building? Yeah. So that everything that passed through to that other building had to go through there. And that was one of the ones when you're looking at a print, looks perfectly simple. That's what actually came up. So a challenging area, make sure you walk your areas. My book ends at home. That was uh, actually those little holes in them used to have a bunch of wires. One night on our, our drew, uh, contractor core drilling, drilled through our patient tower from the top floor down five floors, made sure our core was there, they're all lined up, which we had asked for. And what they did was they somehow missed in their testing that there was that conduit through there. So I just happened to be walking around and it wasn't a concern of mine because I remember I was there that night and I heard, you know, phone systems down for the ninth floor. I was like, that's weird. Then I heard phone systems down for the eighth floor. It's weird, but you know, it's kind of, you know, not my problem. You know, it's already called in IT. Got in the elevator, the guy with the core machine was on the elevator. I thought, oh, you guys are working late. I never, never dawned on me until the next day. I said, I wonder if these guys left these just sitting there and guess what they did. So I still have them, they're my bookends. So any questions, you guys? And no, my bookends are not for sale. Oh, that was, that was my question. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm interested in understanding how you dealt with segmenting the biomed device network from your IT network. That's something that we're considering, um, you know, beyond using, you know, NAC software like Cisco ICE or something like that. Um, is there, have you, do you have experience in physically segmenting your biomed network from the main network of a well, facility? Well, this one right here, that was a complete separate network. And, and the thing about that is I've eliminated some slides on this because this was gonna be a shorter presentation that what we had was we created a shadow network because I used to make a joke that, you know, Erlanger was 90 minutes from anybody. We were in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The closest place to get service was Atlanta, Nashville, Knoxville. If you're driving in Atlanta and somebody's in Alpharetta over here, you're gonna be lucky at rush hour to get them in three hours back in the day when traffic was full bore. So we did was we cre they created like as we did design this we had network for simplicity network A was over here network B was over here each of our monitors had four jacks so we had a primary network and a secondary network because of that issue and it did come into play one night because I was working late one night and our call came in we lost communication on three beds in SICU I was like that's weird. So I said, it's gotta be something network wise. Then all of a sudden, as I was, you know, I was a manager, I was in there that night, two more beds in a different ICU went bad. And I said, what the heck? I said, we got, we got something wrong. We got something, we got a switch or something's going bad. So the first thing I did was I went to the ICU, jumped from primary to secondary, because the secondary was always hot. Immediately, everybody comes up, everybody's happy. What I found out in researching it, and I actually had one of those moments with the on-call network person, was I said, come in here, we need you here now. Nah, that's not that critical. So I said, oh, yes it is. You know, you're gonna come in here now and figure this out. And what happened was somebody kicked, loosened up a power cord. And it was one of those moments where, you know, all buildings vibrate, believe it or not. And eventually this power cord, you know, for some reason or another, there was no, as far as I know, nobody was in this area because they're like eight o'clock at night and they, interstitial area, it just fell out of the back of the switch. And it took out a whole bunch of patient monitors. But the good news was outside of that little bit of time, it was transparent to the nursing users what actually happened. But when we told them, well, here's why we did this, was we put that network up 
and it was, I always consider, yes, number one, it's expensive. You know, so that's something we had to sell. But I was looking at it, if something happened to one side of the building, you know, what's the most important thing that we do? Why, why did I get in biomed? Why am I still here? People, patient safety. If I can't give the equipment to my clinical staff that works, then, you know, the, you know, I've compromised the potential for somebody's outcome. And so one, one of the other funny ones I have, because how much time I got? A couple minutes. Uh, back in the day, I was taxed with, built, taxed with building an emergency room out of, uh, I got a call. They said, build us an emergency room out across town. And I said, what's the print look like? And they said, well, just go down to the cur current emergency room. Just imagine you're duplicating that across town in a place we haven't built yet. I was like, okay. And so one of the things I did was I put the budget together. Two years later, three years later, it came to fruitation. One of the things I used to have a bad, actually good, bad habit of doing was I talked to the staff and I said, how many monitored beds do you want? And they said at the time, there are 15 slots. And I said, okay, so I'm going to set up the same thing I did in that other ICU. What happened was put my budget in. As two years came along, they said, we're tight on money. Greg, we need you to pull the monitors out. And, but this is where I kind of played my dirty trick, was uh, said, no problem, got it. So a certain group of monitors got pulled out. What I did not pull out was I didn't pull out any of my infrastructure. So I finally met, when we were talking about users, clinical people, I met a doctor, Dr. Hamilton, his first meeting and he showed up and I said, you know, pleasure to meet you. And he goes, how many you know, monitors do we have here? And we said, we've actually only got eight sites because, you know, they decided not to install seven monitors. And so he was like, what? That's totally unacceptable. And, you know, he's pretty livid because he should have been, because he had a trauma, he should have been notified that, you know, this is what happened. And so I walked up afterwards and I said, and I showed up, I had this lovely project notebook with different, you know, things like that. And what I did was I said, let me show you something real quick when everybody else was, uh, you know, doing something on a break. And I said, here's where the monitors were deleted. Here's where the networking stuff was not. I said, all you have to do is go out and buy a few monitors and you can turn key this. This is all live and hot. And he was like, really? I said, yep. And he was like, the, you know, and he was like, at that point right there, I was his hero. But it was one of those things that, I had the foresight, I had a lot of, my first assignment was trauma medicine at the University of Michigan, the emergency room survival flight. So I had a long history of that yeah. stuff. And I figured you always have to plan for the worst. If something happens to our main campus, people have to go over here, there's a car wreck across town. You know, where are they gonna hit first? They hit the first emergency room. You keep the people that you can service, the rest of them are gonna air it back out or met air ambulance out. You know, I always believe in just air to caution, which sometimes isn't real popular, but I always look at it. If, it, if I have to rely on something, if that's me in that bed, you know, I want people to have thought that out. 